Yay. Sure. I am going to turn on the slideshow. I'm going to try to close that and people keep an eye on the chat. So, hello, everybody. Hello. Does everybody know Jed? Hi, hello. Jed. Hi. We've got Kenya up front. Say hello to her. Let's talk. Hi. Well, you know, thanks. Um, let me uh, let me start by saying that the forms come out every April because in the old days, which is like four or five years ago, they would roll out changes in forms whenever they were doing them. So they could change the contract three or four times in one year. Uh -huh. And you'd have to go back in and reload it and map it and all that. Uh -huh. So several years ago, they said, hey, let's bring them out on April Fool's Day. I think Brenda probably suggested April Fool's Day for the new. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh so that's why we're we're doing this real quick is to go over the changes the other thing i'll say so you'll all understand we have e &O insurance so does the local association their e &O insurance is through nar nar um if you are using an old form their e o insurance no longer covers you. Mm -hmm. Therefore, our e o insurance looks nasty at us if we turn in old forms. So right now, all the new forms are on internet. Great. I know some of you print stuff out, keep things on your computer. Great. At the end of this month, we will no longer take the older forms. You must use a newer contract. The PCR, I'm very questionable. I don't care much on because one, it's not required by state and two, the change is so minor, it doesn't matter. But at the end of this month, Tracy and, and uh, Kenya will start saying, Kenya, 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 will start saying no if you turn in really old forms. Just want you to be prepared for that. Great. Yes, uh, ma'am. Is the purchase contract the only thing that's really going to be? We're going to look at them right now. Okay, so this, hmm, Chad, uh, delete your old form so you don't use them by accident. Thank you, Maria. That's wise advice. So the first thing to change is the exclusive right to listing. Oh, boy. It is a minor change. What they did was remove that, and I put the red lines up here, that the seller may have to pay fees that would go with governmental loan. Well, that has been removed by the federal government. So we need no longer need to tell folks that they might have to pay. They might have to pay those fees. Now, having said that, let's talk about the listing in my April 3rd date or April 30th. You don't have to go in and update. If you've got a listing agreement from two years ago, you can leave it in there. What I'm talking about is submitting new forms, okay? The old forms will be covered under the old because they were written at a time they were the official form. No problem with that. So if you've got a, uh, like Sherry does new builds, if she's got a contract of, she wrote a year ago and it's not closing till this summer, she does not have to write a new contract. Does that make sense to everybody? Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, this is the explanation. This is the way I set it up, the form, what the explanation was. Wanted to show it to you. Red line means they removed it. That's called a red line review. So the next form, this is a very complex change on this form. <laughs> line 272 was revised to add historic. That is the only change to the entire form is they added historic to the kind of property disclosure because that would be a protected class. Now, I don't need you to go back and do PCRs from a year ago. If you turn in one of the old ones, we will not penalize you because this is not a state required document. And I'm not worried about this one word historic messing with our, you know, insurance. Is there any questions on that? Yes, ma'am. 
you feel other companies might have an issue if we have their absolutely yeah other companies might have an issue with it yes they absolutely will and you can tell them have your broker call my broker you could that'd be the easier way to do it and i again highlighted a little bit so you can see it Seller's net estimate, again, a real complicated change. We're not going to penalize you if you use the old ones. They added this big red line down here that says miscellaneous notes. Isn't that a complex change? <laughs> Thank you. Yay. Any questions on what miscellaneous means? Notes? And what was the, <laughs> can you give us an example on what their thoughts were to even bother? No. Okay. I like, it. I like it. I've had I have had times where I've wanted to put in something specific. I know that where the. I was going to say every single time I fill one of these out, I write on the side does not include any credits. So having that in there is very helpful. Okay. Oh, I'm not saying it's not helpful. I'm just saying it's not a very complex change. No. Yeah. But but I would use other to say seller credits to be because I know how to do that and. And sometimes other was not long everybody. enough. Right. So it's not bad having the extra line. It's just not a complex change. Right. Multiple offer notification. I love this because Erica called me and noted something very astute. They removed, all they did to change was remove tax number. But right above it, they said that you can still be notified by facsimile. For those who don't know, facsimile is the same as a fax. I just thought I'd tell you. So they tell you that you can officially, I, and because they only roll out changes once a year, it'll be next year before they can remove that. Isn't that silly? But again, I understand the purpose. They thought it was outdated, and a lot of people don't use faxes anymore. Yes, ma'am. Microphones. It's not really crossed out. It's more of they, they moved it when they took that out. I know it appears that way. Yes. Email is officially on the form. Yes. That is the so, so don't let it delivered. confuse you too much. But the only change was, as they noted in their notes, the facsimile. I have a question about that. Okay. Um, through all of the multiple offer situations we've had over the past few years, I have never received one of these, um, nor have I given one of them. Is Are you talking about the multiple offer now? What? The oh, okay, yes, offer. go ahead. The multiple offers. Uh -huh. I've never received a notification form like this. I've never given a notification form like this. Is it a required form? Required is what the state requires, and they do not require this form. Uh, and uh, I will confess that in today's more modern way of communicating offers and counter offers and text messages and phone calls, I'm a little frustrated we don't do more things in writing. So officially, how do you prove that you told the other agent there was a multiple offer without a signed form? Email and text. And you can use email and text, but then I'm really going to ask you if you can submit it to us. And most of you don't. We don't ask for it. So if you're asking us as a company, will we require you to use this? No. Do I think it's a good idea? Yes. Brenda? Microphone. Yes. Microphone. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on. on. Okay. It was my understanding that the reason why when you use this is when you sit down with the seller with multiple offers and they say, I don't want to make a decision because these are too close or these are too, you know, we still have other showings or whatever. Then you go back to everyone and send them this form. When you put in the MLS, when you first list the property, our presentation plan is X or Y, or you send out a notice through follow up or through Broker, Broker Bay. Bay that says we're in receipt of multiple offers and we're looking at them at this time. Because what this says is we're calling for highest and best 
after you've delivered an offer already? It, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit because it's only signed by the buyer. It's not signed by the seller. At the top. So the seller signs oh, at the top. I'm sorry. At the top it is and at the bottom. And all of these instructions down here are uh, to the buyer saying, you understand that there's been multiple offers. Our seller has given us permission to note, tell you that there's been multiple offers. And the potential buyers are supposed to sign this and return it that they know so that we can prove through the whole chain of communication, of communication from buyers and sellers that we deliver. Um, and as Lynn pointed out, how many agents out there have never used anything like that or have ever even seen them? So again, is it a good idea to have in writing that everybody knows that there's multiple offers? Yes. Is it required by the state? No. Is it a good idea? Yes. yes. Do a lot of people use them? No. <laughs> Just remember the one big rule with the state is if you let one person know there's multiple offers, you need to let everyone know there's multiple offers. You can't cherry pick just buyers. I had a property that I showed the other day that the agent had received multiple offers. So he uploaded this form and to the document section in the MLS. So anybody else looking at it would know for sure that there were already multiple offers. So I thought that was a good idea. That is a good idea. Mm -hmm. And I like that. And that way they can present it to their buyers to sign off before they present the offer. Any more comments? I was just going to say that I had a notification through Broker Bay. That's probably the best thing that I've seen happen through Broker Bay so far is the fact that the listing agent could communicate through to all of the agents through Broker Bay so well at every step of, you know, now we have multiple offers, we're deciding when to take offers through date and time. And Fair was, enough. It, it was, it was, that was a really good form of communication. I thought. Let, let me go, let me go back and say that from the old days, I, I like very much that everything, we, every negotiating step point is in writing because that's the only way to prove the chain of events that happened. Mm -hmm. I'm also not dumb enough to think that there are verbal offers that are made without saying, do you mind if we do the verbal communication? That doesn't happen. There are text messages that happen. I get all that. I understand how <laughs> times have moved forward. If I got to go to court, I like written things signed by both people. So I know it was presented and it's not some real estate agent's ego that's getting in the way of the earnest money release. That's my two bits. Any more questions about multiple offers? Okay. Final walkthrough and accept property acceptance. There were some changes on this and I did not put all the red line up here on purpose, but the big change of this is the form was only addressing the property is satisfactory and doesn't allow for when it is not. So if you're going to do a final walkthrough, I have to step over here and see, you've got to initial one or the other. How many people in here always do a final walkthrough form? Only a couple. How many people use them sometimes? Everybody. Okay. I don't use them all. Mm -hmm. I don't use them at all. I discovered in the first time. I understand, but I'm trying, you know, and there are other companies that will require that. Do require we know this. You bet. So, so the basic changes of this form is if I've done a final walkthrough and I'm happy with everything, I sign off and I'm done. This one checkbox right here does not agree with the above, with the above buyer to provide a contract amendment. It's hard for me to see all the way over here. In the old form, you would have a space to say, buyer wants this change, that change, and so on. We don't do that anymore. We check off, we do not agree. Okay. And then we submit an amendment. Does anybody have any questions or comments on this form? Okay. The contract. 
Hmm? Da, 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 da. <laughs> Two big changes on page one, line 17 and 21. Two lines were removed. The first line is mortgage assumption addendum. That was removed because they changed that addendum altogether. Okay, we're gonna go over that addendum in a minute. Okay. The second line that was removed is the seller agrees to pay loan costs prohibited by the government. Which well, since no that's no longer a law, we don't need that line anymore. Nope. Greg. Yes. I wrote a contract last night and where that line was, you're right, it's gone. But when you go to click over there for the money amount, there's a hidden line. So if you're not careful, your numbers <laughs> get in the wrong spot. Shocking. So you mean the authentic sign didn't follow up with all the changes on the forms that we submitted? I guess not. <laughs> no, it's it's they did. It's just that they left the dollar value field in there. Gotcha. But it's well, hidden. You can't see that it's there. But if you tab through it, it shows. Right. And so yeah. if you're not careful, you'll put your numbers on the wrong lines. Good. Good direction. And thank you. Okay. Everybody's frantically writing notes now. Uh-oh. Okay. The next change is going to be a little bit more difficult. I know. Oh, you got both sides. And again, I took out the all this two paragraph of red line in here that used to talk about wood infestation, bugs and all that stuff, which is now replaced with line 11 here. That's the old one. You don't need to see what they removed. Other than what you do need to see is what is there now. And let me see if I can give you a quick synopsis. They removed all the language about the VA and who pays for what and so on. They also removed the requirement that the seller pay for treatment if there's something found. This is now a negotiable item. Let me rephrase that or say it one other time. In the old days, they found termites. The seller was required to treat. Now, starting this contract, they are no longer required to treat. It is part of the negotiations of all the repairs that goes into the repair. What I think Lance said, paragraph 14. Now, that means that all of the timelines and everything is laid out in 14, and this just covers the wood infestation a little bit different. I have some thoughts about all of that. Um, I can, you know, I, I said to Lance earlier today, whichever side of the coin I'm on, I can present to my buyer or seller how I think it benefits them. So if I'm a buyer and I'm negotiating repairs and they have termites, well, now that you know you have termites, Mr. Seller, you have to disclose that or go ahead and treat it for everybody that has it. So if this contract falls apart, please go back to your PCR and redo it. Or go ahead and treat it and disclose that you've treated it because you need to. Uh, and maybe that will influence them. Uh, from the seller side, now I can go, we're looking at all the repairs at one shot. You don't have to have here are my repairs, here's my termite, this is what I'm required to do. So it kind of um, straightens up that side. But you guys need to know, it is now a negotiable item. It is not required that they do the termite anymore and the time period that falls under is the same time period as all inspections does anybody have any questions on that comments so that falls under va too va no longer requires they don't require the seller pay for it anymore. and in fact the reason that's there brenda will probably tell me i'm wrong because she knows history better than i do um the reason that's there is it became so common for lenders to require the termite to be inspected. That really was a lender requirement rather than a. And that's one of the things that Greg and I also talked about this morning is that because majority of the time it is a letter requirement, 
if a seller doesn't want to treat, the buyer then can go to their lender and say they're not willing to treat and then give us a letter, get, get us out of this contract, get us our earnest money back. The, the, the flip side of that also, and, and I, the reason I'm, I had to present a, write a contract on this form over the weekend, um, the, other, the flip side of that is how many times have we been in that situation where we've had the termite inspection done at the same time as the home inspection, you have a laundry list of things that your buyers want to be repaired. Oh, and by the way, you also have termites. So now you're forcing the seller to do the termite treatment, which means the sellers are probably going to be less likely to do the other repairs. Mm -hmm. So this puts it all together in one big ball of fluff. Can you go over the logic again of getting your earnest money back on your letter? If the lender is going to require that a home be treated, because it's got termites, the buyer, and if the seller, if you ask the buyer to treat it, and then the seller says no, then the buyer could go back to the lender and say they're not willing to treat. If the buyer, if the lender says it's got to be treated, either you pay, the buyer pays for it or the seller pays for it, would the buyer not be able to say, I don't want to do this, give me a letter that you won't give me the loan because it has the termites well, well, and back I out. Keep Chris the microphone. Okay. Hey, cool. <laughs> Hi, right, folks. Thanks for showing up today. Don't forget to tip your weight. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody from out of town? <laughs> <laughs> Any anniversaries tonight? Any anniversaries? <laughs> um, no, all I was all I was thinking was, you know, when you said that my mind automatically went to be careful with that advice because it's not mandatory that anybody does it. So if you say to your lender, Hey, they're not going to do it. Give me a letter that I don't get my loan anymore. What's the, what's the basis of that? Does it change their DTI? Does it, does it, if they had to pay, if they have the money to pay for it, why would that get them out of the loan? You know what I'm you know what I'm saying? Sorry. If it's now if it is now a home inspection negotiation and a buyer and seller negotiate in good faith and can't come to an agreement on repairs, whether it be termite or anything else, anything else. then it's it, right. The loan die, or I mean, the deal dies. Yes. The risk with giving a rejection letter is that now the loan also dies, and that buyer has a difficult time getting a new approval. So it's better to go off of the inspection. Right. And I Don't put it on the lender. With that, my flip side to that is. I, I struggle with what VA and FHA requirements that come along that repairs, if repairs aren't made by closing, are they going to get the loan? So I think for me, it's it's going to be up to the, the lender and whether or not we can get this done and whether or not the buyer can take care of it themselves. I, I would want the buyers to take care of it themselves before letting the deal fall apart. Um, but we all know that we're going to have some buyers that are going to say, ah. Well, let me throw my two bits in. Uh, I think the more documentation you have is never a good idea. You don't have to say your loan is rejected in the letter from the bank. You could say this lender requires termite treatment. And if that requirement is made, you can still go back to paragraph 14, which says we've got to negotiate this. We can't come to the agreement. The deal dies because of 14. We've not killed the loan. We've only said what the lender requires. And the buyer's loan would still be valid for them to go buy another house just because that house they didn't because of the okay. wood infestation. It should not affect the buyer's ability to go buy another one that doesn't have termites. I think we've talked this one to death. It's a good <laughs> Does anybody have any? It was a great conversation. Microphone, Chris. There's one right in front of you. I mean, for the last... Well, as far as I know, the last 20 years, that's been in, that's been this way. So all of these questions are going to come up from agents. So I think it was really good conversation oh, that we had, whether it be lender rejection letters, put it in the 
repairs or things like that. I, and super helpful. I had a, a termite inspection the other day and the um, inspector asked, the seller was sitting there and said, is this a VA loan? I said, yes. And he looked at the seller. He says, you're going to need to pay for it. Of course, the other agent forgot to tell the seller that <laughs> I was representing the buyer, but he goes, uh, I am. Oh, okay. But <laughs> I said, Thank but you. I told Tony, I said, you know, as of April 1st, you're no longer going to have to require a seller to pay. He goes, I'll be glad of that. I've got $10,000 in invoices the sellers wouldn't pay. <laughs> so it's for the sell for the termite inspectors, I think it's a good thing too. I, I don't think it's a bad thing for anybody. I think when you're negotiating items in good faith, everything's fine. When things go sideways and you're not in good faith, it's always trouble. And as long as you recognize that and move forward, what we are doing now is not saying you're pre-obligated by accepting this to have to do X. And I like that. This is a great opportunity to have a conversation with all your lenders about this change and do well, they know. Well, I understand, but find out what their underwriting guidelines are for their company because every lender is different, every bank is different, every credit yep. union is different. This is a very important point for you to have a discussion with all your favorite lenders. Fact, well, I wish and, and I think the law changed last year or the year prior, and because of that, the lenders are all very aware of that. They were living within the confines of our contract, which has now been updated to reflect what the law is. So any more questions? Does everybody, and this is a raise your hand time, does everybody understand termite treatment is now a negotiable item? Yay. Okay, we won't forget that. I have a hard time hearing a lot of you, and when I'm on Zoom, I can't hear the questions. Unknown caller. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. We have a comment, too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, and I'm not a sir. You were sir. Uh, yeah, I'm a sergeant. He doesn't identify as a sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, possession after closing addendum. The big change here is they no longer have a per day um, amount. It is your a flat fixed amount payable at closing. Explain. Let me respite, let me reply, state that. Consideration for extended possession. I'm going the seller shall pay the buyer X number of dollars, not X number of dollars per day, a flat fee payable at closing. <laughs> what happens if we can't get possession on time? Well, like everything else, you write up an addendum that says due to not being able to close on the fifth, we will accept another. $6,000 to close on the 10th. That'd be a good deal, wouldn't it? I'd get six grand. But we're going to close. It. So that's it's a simple change, but it is something you might want to think about a little bit when you're writing up. Up, If the buyer, if the seller or the buyer wants, you know, $100 a day, we need to figure out how many days and put the flat amount in there. Is this put on the HUD or is this a check directly from seller to the buyer? I believe everything goes on the HUD in my life. It's not on the HUD. I don't like it. Yes, Kathy, we got a closer here. Tell us. What if the lender does not accept it? Well, then we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Because a lot of lenders will not re will not let us put that on a HUD as a debit credit. Well, you know the, that's you know the golden money rule, to right? The buyer. You know the golden rule? He who has the gold rules. Yeah. Now, if the lender says it's not going on the HUD, it don't go on the HUD. Is this form something that we need to give to the lender? Can't hear you. She asked if it was something that needs to go to the lender. Yes. Uh, again? It has to go on the HUD. If it goes on the HUD, it has to go to the lender. And again, in my humble opinion, share it with everybody. And the lender's got the gold. And ask them, do you want this or not? Because the loan originator ain't the guy that gets to see it at the end that they got to satisfy. The loan originator will tell you the scoop. Okay. Yes, Sergeant. Thank you, Maria. I appreciate it so much. 
<laughs> you have a question, Brendan? No, not no. Okay. Right to repair contract addendum. This again is a very, very simple change. All of our other forums quote the Kansas statute that the law says we have to do this under. What they did here was write in the statute number. That's it. No other changes. And this applies mostly to new construction and contractors and says you won't sue them you know, within, without giving them the right to try to fix it. That's all the form is. But the only change to the form is we put in the Kansas law. Cancellation of contract. This is an oversimplification of an already simple form. <laughs> Lance is laughing, Brenda's seen it. What they did is so many buyers and sellers were refusing to sign this because they figured by signing it, it was gonna release the earnest money. They didn't read it or their agents didn't explain it properly. So up here in green, they added these words. All claims regarding the purchase contract on the above reference property, excluding earnest money distribution. So you can sign that and cancel the contract and no earnest money goes anywhere. That's what that means. Then down below, release of earnest money. Again, cancellation, release, and people were still confused. So they added the words down here that this bottom section has nothing to do with the purchase contract except the release of earnest money. And who gets it? Pretty plain and simple. Questions? Comments? Are you glad they changed this for you? Yeah, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm snarky. Yeah, really. Property inspection uh, um, brochure. How many here have handed out a property inspection brochure? Brenda, thank you. Yep, Lob and Jed. Lance? I did. Thank you. Was that uh, Erica? Okay. I, I don't know what the old form looks like because I haven't been out practicing in some time. I will say that the new form has some pretty good information in it. Um, you can print it up on, an, on a legal form. It notations, not it's, it's for the seller and the buyer in that it says, this is what you can expect from an inspection. These are the things they're looking for. If there's a repair addendum, this is what it will include. So it kind of sets the expectations for both buyer and seller. And instead of saying, what do you mean they're going to inspect my house? Or can I walk through the house and I know that the kids scribble on the wall? I want that as part of the repair inspection. No, kids scribbled on the wall and you saw it when it was first there. That should have been part of your contract that you submitted because you submitted it knowing what cosmetic items you could see. Um, says what the inspector's role is. Page two kind of goes through the checklist, the buyer's and seller's responsibility. I think it's a pretty decent form overall. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, we got a chat. Uh, yes, okay, thanks, Pam. She, she uses the form. Uh, Anybody want to read any more of this? Have you seen enough? Okay. Mortgage assumption contract disclosure. This is new. And we had some discussion about this before we had this class. So let me describe what this form is for and how what we're going to do as a company. If because in the last few years we've had a lot of really low interest loans. It could be potentially possible that a seller would offer to transfer the loan, if you will, to the new buyer. The new buyer could assume it and assume that interest rate. They still have to go through all the process. First, the lender has to agree it's assumable. Uh, the buyer has to be qualified. The house still has to appraise and so on. 
Now, if I saw, if I bought my house four years ago and I've got this ultra low interest rate, with the way homes have inflated in Wichita over the last four years, I'm going to have to have a fairly substantial down payment. But you guys are also offering twenty thousand dollars over asking price with an appraisal uh, bump in case they, the house doesn't appraise, uh, and so on. So there may be that kind of cash. And it says right at the top that this seller disclosure is meant to be filled out with the listing agreement. So we talked about whether we should require it on every home. Because I think that other companies will say, we want to have your uh, mortgage assumption disclosure. Well, here's the deal. In the listing agreement at the very top, it offers the terms that you will accept for an offer on this house, VA, FHA, and so on. And one of those terms could be a mortgage assumption. If your seller does not offer it as a mortgage assumption, there's no reason to fill out this form. If they say they're going to take mortgage assumption, then we need to have this form filled out prior to putting the house on the market. Does everybody understand that? It does not go on the MLS, correct? It never goes in the MLS because there's private information in here that we don't want in the computer. This would be given to the buyer whenever uh, an offer was about to be made and they wanted to assume the loan. But the nice thing is we'd already have this filled out should your seller want to do that. Okay. Now, how, how many of you guys think that your seller would already know if their loan's assumable or not. They don't. Exactly. So this would be a good time to discuss it with them and the benefits of it, but understand there's going to be, it will limit their buyers to those with a whole lot of cash if they're going to assume the loan. Go ahead, Lynn. Okay. So do we give this to the buyer during the offering period or after it becomes a contract? Because again, there's information on here that I don't think a buyer should have unless they're actually under contract. In my humble opinion, okay. you're going to market in the MLS that it would be assumable because you can search for assumable properties. If somebody submits a con an offer and you find it acceptable, then you could give them this form. Having said that, in conversations with the other agent, we've got somebody who wants to assume the loan. We need to know the details. I'm not going to give you this form until we have an acceptable offer, but I will discuss the terms on it so that you can properly construct your offer. Does that make sense? Do we need to have them pre-approved by somebody? Microphone. Do we need to have them pre-approved by somebody before we just send them to our lender? Or? That's a tough question because I don't want Rocket Mortgage out of, you know, mm -hmm. wherever in, in New York trying to pre-qualify somebody so that I can submit it Why to don't this lender. waiting thinking they're going to go to this bank and then get oh, pre-approved? I, th I think if they're going to go to this bank, that's where they need to go to get pre-approved. And from there, they'll see if they pre-approve for a assumable. Because this bank's approval is who I care about. I don't care about other lenders from places. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just I think that takes time. It does. I think it takes time if they've not been pre-approved and they just think they're going to come in and assume and alone and we have other people. I mean, why would you choose that? That that would be a consideration for the seller, mate. However, if I had somebody who offered fifty thousand dollars over cash or over offer, and here's my letter saying that I've got fifty grand. That's a pretty safe bet. And if they could assume it, yeah, I might have to wait for them to be approved. But I'm are we right. not going to go into the creative financing again, where there might be a seller carry back, assuming loans so that the down payment isn't so great? I don't believe in carry back. That's her <laughs> I got into real estate. That's the only thing we could do because it was 15% interest rate. Yeah, that's my personal opinion. You're right. Um, 
And as Dixie points out, assumable loans are only FHA and VA. Conventional conventionals are not assumable. Um, um, I think each situation is going to be relatively. It's going to be individual. There's no way I can give you a blanket answer to everything. What I can tell you is when you're listing it, and a loan is assumable, and you think that there might be a market for that, then have this form filled out. You had a comment, Lance? I was just going to let Lynn know on the first page under the financing area, on the purchase price, there is that line other, and it says, see miscellaneous paragraph 32. That's where you would spell out the other constructive financing that you would have. I have a question. Microphone. Sorry. So I don't know about you guys, but personally, I think this form is years ahead of where it need, needs to be. Have you, any of you guys talked to any lenders that will do assumptions? I have talked to all of my lenders None of them will do assumptions. None of them even have an idea how to do them. So my question is this whole, you know, if you guys have talked to lenders that will do assumptions, cool. Let me know who they are. If, if not, um, I think this form is a whole bunch of to do about nothing because nobody's even doing them that I know. Nobody knows how to, um, nobody knows how to do them. And because like Dixie says, FHA and VA are the ones that are going to be most assumable, right? So VA are doing it because they got no money down. So any where are they going to come up with the money for the equity? FHA is 3.5% down. Everybody knows that most people are going FHA because they don't have a whole lot of money over top. If they did, they'd go conventional. So and, and my, so my qu is, a, is a question and a statement. If anybody has talked to any of their lenders that do with some assumables, know how they work and are able to deal with it, please let me know because I need to talk to them. Well, if not, it. then. Well, well, Dixie says here, she's just spoken with one lender on a house and she's going to listen. They are willing. And, and understand that the assumable would have been written into the contract four years ago. Yeah, it's now, not up to the lender. Assumable. It's not up to the lender. The lender has to get on board and figure out how it's done because it it's a uh, it's an assumable loan. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not talking about whether or not the lender that has the loan will allow it to be assumable. That part, yes, you're absolutely right. They have to do it. I get it. What I'm talking and and you ha generally have to go back to that original lender to do it. You can't go to Fidelity to assume something that came out of whatever rocket. I mean, I get that. What I'm talking about is how do you deal with the money that's over top of it if they don't have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars in cash? That's what the lenders ha haven't been able to figure out that I've talked to anyway. And and I think that's exactly what I'm saying. They're going to have to have cash. And it's sorry. If you speak with the VA lenders and VA lenders that do a crap ton of VA lending, they will tell you that the assumable clause in the VA, the standard VA mortgage, um, the mortgage and the VA clause contradict each other because the VA clause says that this loan is assumable. However, the mortgage says that in order for um, someone to purchase the home, the mortgage must be paid off. What they don't have in place anymore and what Chris was talking about hmm. is a way to for someone to formally assume the mortgage and relieve the seller of the liability if it's not paid. Which yeah. Alita also pointed out, right. if you're advising a seller, you have to understand there could still be a liability issue yep. with the current seller. So it's a long conversation to try to take advantage of a couple of, of uh, interest points. But if you are, should we have a sudden rise and we hit 12% interest and we're sitting on a 3% interest rate, I can see that people will get interested in exploring it. And that's what this form is about, exploring it and seeing where your seller and the buyer could use it or could not use it. My understanding um, when they came out with the, the, the 
the, the, the uh, new purchaser has to qualify for the loan mm -hmm, they is, do. is at the time, because they have to qualify, there is a release of liability and there is a release of VA um, eligibility that can be signed. Again, I think that's going to be each individual lender and so on. But what I was told, because I'm a vet, if I use my VA loan to buy a house and it was assumed, I, would, I could not get another VA loan until that was released. Is that current? Because that's not what I've heard the current yeah. situation is. It is current? Okay. So all I'm saying is, here's a form. And we're having great discussion. I'm not trying to discourage it, but there's so much of this discussion that's going to be individual depending on the bank and the circumstances and so on. It's a great time to explore that with your client, start thinking about it. But he who has the gold is going to tell you the rules. Okay. That's the way it is. Um, any more discussion on assumption? Okay. And that's it. So remember, important date, end of the month. Don't use old stuff. Don't let the new forms screw you up because they're pretty much just restating what we used to do. Okay, real quick. Yes, ma'am. The new forms are effective now, but they're not going to be required till the end. Is I that won't right? require them till the end okay. of the month. They are in AuthentiSign currently. All right. Any questions online? Hey, is there support that we can make suggestions on these forms? Yes. Like next time? There's a forms committee that Cindy Siggs is in charge of. Just shoot her an email and she will uh, submit them to the committee. And you could even join the committee if you wanted to. Okay, thank you. <laughs> sure, no problem. Yes. You're quite welcome, Mark. <laughs> I won't forget that for some time. <laughs> you should. All right, guys, I'm going to stop recording. Thank you so much. Thanks, Greg. You betcha.